All right, what a high Sabbath. So you'll, t- you'll notice, that, by the way, the message that, that I have this, this, this morning's title, What Do I Get? And it goes along with, with what happened today with the baptism and anyone giving their heart to Christ. Um, what do I get? Well, <clears throat> everybody has a motive, don't they? Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll, we'll get into this, this, the idea of the rest of this message. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you and praise you this morning for the blessing this Sabbath has been for me. Uh, Lord, we come here today uh, seeking you as we, as we do like on a daily basis, I would hope. But today, Lord, has been a great blessing. I feel in your presence that your spirit's working on our hearts. I thank you, Lord, for today, for the baptism, or at least giving our heart to you fully, and for the way you're working in, in young people's lives here and uh, as well as the older. Lord, I pray today that um, the message that is presented now will be your words and that we will each one be drawn closer to you and have a view of, of, uh, of your love and your character uh, as we go through this message. And I ask in Jesus' name, amen. You know, I, I almost preached today, by the way, on, on a completely different topic, changed my mind with the things that are going on in some of the churches in the world, but I'm going to save that for next week, probably. But... Uh, you think about why people do what they do. I want to talk about a little bit about motive and, and how it can, it's, it's contained in the Bible as well. God always has a motive for everything he does. You know, Jesus never done anything without an ulterior motive. Even Jesus. You knew that, right? It sounds, it sounds like underhanded or, or undermining what he's doing, but actually Jesus always had an ulterior motive. You know, he, he never healed anybody just to help them. Did you know that? You notice every time he heals someone, he would always bring them to, to a, a, a realization or an idea trying to get them into the kingdom of heaven. He didn't just heal them and walk away. He didn't just feed somebody and walk away. He always had this motive of trying to re- present the, the gospel to them. And I, I appreciate that about when I read through the, the Bible and what, God, what God's doing. But everybody that does anything, no matter what it is, you have a motive, ulterior motive. As a matter of fact, I, I think it's interesting. The, the number one question when someone gets killed when someone's murdered, they, they, find, they, they say, well, what are they gonna, how are we going to figure out who done this? And they say, well, we've got to find out who may have had a motive. So the first thing they do is they go to all their enemies, and they start looking at the enemies. Then they go to all their friends, because their friends are usually the ones with the motive. They're closest, closest relatives, right? And they're trying to find out who knew this person and who may have done it. What's the motive behind what just took place? Because no one, or very rarely, almost never does it just happen by random accident or random chance. There's always a motive when someone is harmed or something goes on. So, you know, it's, it's um, the, strong, the greater the action, the stronger the motive. And we went over that before in another, another angle, but the, the, greater the, the greater the action that takes place, the stronger the motive may be. For instance, all of you who are here today for some reason, for, there's a motive. Like we have some people traveled, I think, all the way from like California, is that right, here today? Because they had a motive, didn't they? And they're here for that reason. Some, some people are here today, because their spouse made them. That's your motive, right? If I don't come, I'm going to have a miserable week this week. Right? Some are here because, because their parents made them be here. Right? Some are here because they love to be here. Some, some are here because they think the pastor's good looking. <laughs> Nobody in this congregation. Actually, you can ask Laura. There was, there, when I was preaching over in Cape. There was this couple that joined a church, and this lady, she actually said, told us one time that she'd like to come and look at the pastor. You talk about embarrassing. I can never get up front and look at and preach and look at her ever again. You know, it wasn't anything there, of course, but but everybody has a reason for doing what they do, don't they? <clears throat> Some people see that things are getting worse and worse in the world, and you think there's got to be answers somewhere. And some people actually come to church looking for the answers. And I think it's tragic, oftentimes, when people are seeing those things happen, and they go to church, and it's a bunch of nonsense. It's just like the rest of the world, and they just go away just as empty as they came. And, of course, everyone, I think, would like to have, think their motive is just here to worship God or something, learn something more about him. But ultimately, we have a motive, right? There's a reason that we're here. And um, getting into that idea, that thought, many people oftentimes, because of the idea of a motive or what, what, what reason do I have to do what I do, put off following Christ, put off making a commitment to him, until things are right, right? Because I've got to have the right reason to go. And, and I've had people say, you know, when I retire, 
and I don't have to deal with like maybe Sabbath work issues and things like that. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead. I'm gonna I'm gonna follow Jesus. I've actually people thinking along those lines, you know. Or when my when my spouse makes a decision, then I'll make a decision. Have you heard somebody say that? Like they're waiting on somebody else in their family to decide to follow Jesus before they get the right reason to do it themselves. Or my most favorite one, when studying with someone and they and they see the gospel, they they see Christ and they they understand this this, this weighing the balances of eternal life and what 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 is what's what's hanging in the balance, and they'll be like, yeah, you know, when I get my life straightened out, I want to come to Christ. It's like. You know, I'm all muddy and filthy, so I'm going to go take a shower so I can take a bath. Get cleaned up first, right? It, it doesn't make any sense. But I want to notice something in our Bibles today. I think it's quite interesting about when people begin to follow Jesus. You know, he always calls them, almost, I mean, most, most without exception, um, and, and we'll just look at a few of those today. And we're going to go to Luke chapter 5 if you want to start turning that direction because I know I don't give you every time to get there. But it's interesting that, that Jesus himself calls people at the most inconvenient time, right? You, you're, you, if you're waiting to give your heart to Christ and completely follow him and surrender him, your life to, his, to what he wants you to do and live for him, if you're going to wait till that time, it'll never be a convenient time. As a matter of fact, I think that even God himself makes it to where it's, it's, he allows it to be not convenient, Right? And in all honesty, it gets better after following him, after turning your heart over to him. A lot of the things that are weighing you down and getting your way go away because they no longer become as important as they used to be. Did you hear what I said with that, right? When you start following Christ, the things that look so important prior to following him suddenly don't look so important anymore. Right? They're secondary. You may still enjoy certain things. You may still do certain things, but they become secondary. And so here in chapter 5 of Luke, I love this story as to what takes place here. So I'm going to pick it up. Just start in verse 1. It came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gesenerat and saw two ships standing by the lake. But the fishermen were gone out of them, and they were washing their nets. And so he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and he, and he prayed him that he would thrust him out a little from the land. So Jesus gets into the, somebody else's boat, right? And he's standing there as a crowd around him, so he wants to be able to preach. So he steps in a boat and says, just push me out a little ways. And so then Jesus sat down and taught the people out of the boat. Now, when he had left speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a drop. <clears throat> Simon answered and said to him, Master, um, I'm going to paraphrase this a little bit here. I'll read it from the Bible directly. But he basically says, Master, I'm a professional fisherman. And uh, we fished all night because, you see, the water is kind of clear and the fish see the net and they won't swim into it. And you've got to go out way out in the deep to be able to catch these fish, we're in here shallow, we're, it's, there's no fish here. That's Simon's thought process. After all, anybody here like to fish, right? I, I'm, I'm a pretty good fisherman. You know, some of you are pretty good fishermen, right? You know how to catch fish, right? And if somebody told me to go, like, cast out into this area where I knew there was no fish, I'd be like, I'm not wasting my time, right? And, and then if they insisted, I would even feel insulted that they would maybe be thinking that I don't know how, what I'm doing. And so you can imagine when, whenever Jesus tells Peter, hey, guys, go out here in this area where, the, where there's no fish and let down your net. What a waste of time. By the way, what were they doing to their nets? They were cleaning them, right? You know why you clean your nets? Because they rot. If you don't, get them, if you don't clean them, get, get, the, uh, you know, get them all cleaned and dried up and everything, they'll rot and, and be ruined. So if they've been cleaning their nets and I take them back out and put them in the water again, what then I must do? Clean them again. It's like, I don't want to waste my time doing this, Right? But nevertheless, I, I just like understanding what's taking place when you read it, right? Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night, and we've taken nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, we'll let down the net. <laughs> so when they had done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net broke. And they beckoned to their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, so that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw it, <laughs> you can imagine in all the excitement, they're loading up the fish. This is so exciting. They're getting all the fish loaded up, taking selfies, right? Like, look at my picture of my fish, right? Loading it all up. And then that moment, in the moment when all this was going on, Peter realizes what had just happened. Something that's totally impossible had just taken place, right? And by the way, this is enough fish that they're going to have more fish today that they can sell than they have for a year. They got a, like a year's supply of income in one day. And Peter, in all the excitement, realizes this has never happened before. So he turns, and it says, and 
um, they filled both ships, and when Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, I'm a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished at all that were, and all that were with him at the draught of the fishes which they had taken in. And so, also, and so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were their partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From henceforth, you're going to catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, listen to what it says, they forsook all and followed him. It's at the height of business. It's the best day they've had ever fishing. These, it's what they've done for a living. They were going to be able to take all these fish and sell them, and they were going to have all the money they needed, perhaps even buy new nets and new fish, I mean, a new boat, rather, and, and, and go out and catch even more fish, and their, and their business could expand. And it's at the height of that that Jesus says, all right, stop everything and follow me. You know, <laughs> to me, it would be much easier if uh, they had caught nothing and they were pretty much going broke and things weren't going too well, and Jesus said, follow me. They said, well, I ain't got nothing to lose. I'll just go, right? But instead, Jesus finds them at the height of their careers. He blesses them with all that. He said, come on, follow me, right? And, and what did Jesus at that moment really have to offer? You, you keep, keep in mind, this is early in his ministry. He says, the foxes have holes, the birds have nests, but I don't even have a pillow. Follow me. Not very convenient, but yet it said they followed, left everything, forsook everything, and followed him. I think perhaps I can picture Zebedee, the father of James and John, the two of them that followed, looking off and seeing their, his sons and their fishing partners walk away, and these two boats up on the shore full of fish, wondering what in the world are they doing? His parents, their parents, thinking, what in the world are they doing? Why are they leaving because they're going to turn the world upside down? But they left. They forsook all. But then you go on. What's interesting, we're still in Luke chapter, uh, Luke chapter 5, and we go down to verse 27. There's another fellow at the height of his career, peaking. Verse 27 of Luke chapter 5, after these things, he went forth and saw a publican. A publican. Does everyone know what a publican is? It doesn't, it's not a republican. It's a publican, right? It's a tax collector, Okay, and so you have this publican, this tax collector named Levi, Matthew Levi, right, sitting at the receipt of custom. Now, you know what that means? I've done a little bit of looking into that. Okay, when he's sitting at the receipt of custom, that means he's there collecting taxes, right? And these guys, publicans, were, were hated specifically by the other Jews, and, and they, were, they were seen as sellouts to the Romans, Right? They had power to even charge more than what was expected, and they, could skim, they would skim their part off the top. Remember Zacchaeus? The wee little man, the wee little man was he? Remember him? Okay, Zacchaeus was doing that very thing. He was, he was taking more than what the people owed him, but he had the power of the Roman government backing him. He had the police to back him up, so you either paid it or you got in trouble. And so he was taking more, causing people to have to pay more, and he would skim off what he wanted, and he was becoming extremely wealthy and given, giving the rest to the Roman government that they said they needed, but he had the power of the government behind him, and so he was, he was actually making more money than you could ever imagine. Matthew, that publican, hey, if you're hated by everybody already, why not? So he's sitting at the receipt of custom, in, at the height of his business, making the money. Actually, people could, wouldn't you love to have this job? You sit there and people bring you money. Isn't that great? People actually show up and come and hand you money. You don't have to do anything other than to receive it, and you get a large cut of it. At the height of his business, sitting at the receipt of custom, Jesus comes by, it says, and said to him, follow me. And he left all, rose up, and followed him. Matthew had a good job making lots of money. But at that moment, when it was the most inconvenient time, he jumps up and leaves and follows Jesus. You know, I, both of these stories, when I read those, I try to think about how that would go today. Can you imagine if Jesus come around today and you was working at your job and you just got the best raise you've ever had and things were just going great and Jesus says, you know what, it's time to forsake that and follow me. Now, it's interesting because he doesn't always require people to forsake what they're doing in order to follow him. Right? He doesn't always say, you've got to quit your job and leave to follow me. He doesn't say that. But here's what he does say, and we're going to show this as we move through. You have to be willing to. Right? There's never a convenient time to follow Jesus in this world. 
it's never going to be convenient. It's never going to be just the right time in the right place and say, okay, I got all my ducks in a row, everything's lined up, I'll give my heart to Jesus and follow him now. And he demonstrates this by when he calls his followers here. I, I, not trying to sound, well, I don't care how it sounds actually, it doesn't matter, God knows my heart. <clears throat> when God called me to be a Christian, when I, when I started following him, I, I really, there was nothing, I didn't lose anything, I'll just put it that way. I kept my job, I was faithful. But one time he calls me to be a minister, like he called me to actually into the pastoral ministry. It's a long story. Some of you have heard some of it, but I didn't apply for the job. I'll just put it that way. I never applied for a job of being a minister. Never. Had no intentions. But when I was called into it, my last year at the work I was working, the job I was working, and my first year of ministry was literally a 50% pay cut. I made half as much the first year of ministry as my last year I made working. Never missed it. Laura may have. But it was never going to be convenient to be called to do what God calls us to do. Like, the world's going to see to it. It's never going to be a convenient time. I'm thankful that uh, some, when they're very young, make that commitment. I'm grateful when some are a little older make that commitment. But at no point in your life is it going to be like, oh, yeah, everything's good. I can do it now. You just have to decide to follow these guys. It's very powerful when you think about this. If he called today... The very same scenario, how many of you, how many of us think that at the moment you're at, you could just walk away from everything and, and, and just follow him if it was the same scenario? You'd be all sad about all the stuff you had to give up, wouldn't you? Right? But you never find these guys complaining about that. So what did Matthew lose? What did the disciples lose? We would look back now and say they lost nothing, right? They gained everything. What would be a reason to follow anything, anyone? What would be the reason they would follow? You know they had to ask a certain question. The disciples would have to ask a certain question. When they, when, they, when they walked away from their boat to follow Jesus, when they walked away from the receipt of custom to follow Jesus, when each one walked away from whatever they was doing to follow Jesus, they had to ask a question. There was a question that had to come in their mind. The question would be, what's in it for me? I mean, if I'm leaving my boats and my family and leaving all my, all my earthly possessions and everything that I have, all this stuff that I have now, if I'm going to leave it behind, what's in it for me? You know they had to ask that question. Some people would say, uh, like, I've, I've met some of you people that are, that are really pious. Say, oh, I would never ask that. I just, I just love Jesus, so I'm not, I'll never ask that question, what's in it for me. And that, that, now you're lying. Because we have to think along those lines. We have to ask that. Right? We do love Jesus, for sure. But for what reason? What's in it for me? Why are we here today? Why am I a follower of Jesus? What's your motive for living the way you do? You know, I've actually met people that are really strong in like the, the health aspect, the health message, right? And, and they do it because they, they feel like they want their, they be so healthy and feel so good and, be, and, and all, you know, like it's, it's about me being very healthy, that's their motive. Now, I won't condemn that in and of itself, but I think that the reason for living and eating healthy and living a healthy life is to glorify Jesus. Like, motive is quite important. You know, there's lots of people, I understand that the Beatles were vegetarian. They also taught people how to smoke dope. <laughs> kind of an imbalance there, right? But there's a motive. Healthful living makes me healthy. It makes me healthy. And those that don't have, feel like they have a motive to live that way, don't. I, actually, I think that some, sometimes the motive for not living healthy is because it, it, is, it is oftentimes so much more enjoyable to eat garbage and live like um, lazily, I guess you could say, instead of you know, eating healthy and exercising. It's so much easier to do the other that you may, maybe you feel like, uh, I'll take my chances on the consequences, right? So your motive is even different. The motive for living unhealthy is very similar to the one for living healthy, and, and it's basically you're trying to, the ones that live, I guess, unhealthy are trying to get it all now. The ones that are living healthy are trying to live it longer. They would, some would rather live the way they want to live and hope there's no consequences for it. But the bottom line is, no matter how we live our lives, we're asking the question, what do I get out of it? What's in it for me? And that's exactly what Peter asks, and we're going to go to now. And I think this story will help sum up everything very, very, very succinctly, if you will. Peter asks exactly the same question. And here's what I think is interesting. Sometimes if I would say, like, okay, if I want to be a Christian, what's in it for me? You would, you maybe, maybe you would rebuke me in some way, right? It's not about you. It's about Jesus, right? 
It's not about you, right? But Peter has the very same opportunity, and we're going to turn there now to Matthew chapter 19. You turn there with me. By the way, this is going to be a relatively short sermon today. I planned it that way because we had a baptism, but everything seemed to have gone smooth and quickly, right? Nevertheless, I think there's going to be a strong message for us here, okay? Matthew chapter 19, I love this story. We're going to start in verse 16. Matthew 19 and verse 16, there was a fellow, and I love how it's worded here. It says, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? What's this guy doing? He, has, he wants eternal life. He has, he has a motive for coming to Jesus. He's wanting to find out his, his mindset, his thought process is what, is, what can I get? How can I get eternal life? Isn't that actually, when you think about it, what everybody ultimately wants? Right? When you choose a religion, I, I've mentioned this before in, in like the prayer meeting setting, when you choose a, a faith or religion, you know, what, what, what would be the basis of choosing what you want to believe or what you want to follow? If I can look at, at the leader of every single religion out there, right, and which one's going to be the most attractive, it would be the one that beat death. Right? My motive is I want to live forever, don't you? I mean, what human being doesn't want to be able to live forever? Only somebody that's maybe not altogether there, but you want somehow, you, and you can see that when you just see people fighting for, for their life when they're laying there dying. You know, you would, you would think that there would be a certain point that your body would just say, you know what, this is painful, this hurts, I just want to, I just want to die, and you would just die, but yet the body, and, and, the, and somehow there's something that goes on that you fight until the very end to stay alive, even in pain, because there's something inherent in us that wants eternal life, and so we ask this question, honestly, the motive for being baptized today is eternal life. The motive for what I do is eternal life. I'll tell you up front, that's my motive, Right? That's what's in it for me. Now, the, the blessings that come along with it, you know, even in this world are great. But Jesus will mention that in just a moment. So this guy comes running up to Jesus, and he says, you know, I looked at Muhammad, and he's dead. And well, Actually, he isn't around yet, but still, I'm just, it's my thinking. And I looked at Confucius, and he's dead. And I looked at Buddha, and he's dead. And uh, I have an understanding that you actually have the power to raise the dead. So I want to know, <laughs> how can I have eternal life? Fair enough question, isn't it? I mean, I would like to think that every one of you, your ultimate motive for being here today is the thought that maybe I can have eternal life. Because if I miss that, like every one of you, every one of us, we're doomed. And so, Jesus answers him. First of all, he changes the subject and says, why do you call me good? There's none good but one, that is God. But if you'll enter into life, keep the commandments. By the way, all he's doing is letting the guy know, <clears throat> you just called me God. Jesus doesn't deny the fact that he's God. He just says there's none good but God. Okay, now we'll go on with your, with your question, right? If you're going to enter life, what's he say to do? Keep the commandments. Sounds very legalistic, doesn't it? Notice he doesn't say have faith. Notice he doesn't say, uh, you know, believe in me. He says if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Now, he's going somewhere with that. By the way, you've got the rest of the Bible that answers that question. It, it's faith in Christ that saves us, right? But we're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. But Jesus here is taking him somewhere. He's letting him know that there's something missing in his life, okay? But he actually just says to him, keep the commandments. Again, don't miss that prior to that, he, he said that you just said that I'm God. So that it, there's a process here. He's letting him know that you're you're having some trust in me, you're, you're coming to me for eternal life, so obviously you must think that I have that, right? I have that, or you wouldn't come to me and ask the question. So he said to Jesus, and I love this answer, which ones? Keep the commandments if you want to go to heaven. Which ones? Now, I don't know if you've ever studied this out or looked at it before, but Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder. Does anybody know what number commandment that is? I'll tell you, it's six. Right? So he skips commandments 1 through 5 and goes to commandment 6. Don't murder. And the guy's like, okay, I can do that. You shall not commit adultery. That's number 7. Thou shall not steal. That's number 8. Thou shall not bear false witness. That's number 9. Honor your father and your mother. That's number 5. So isn't it interesting what he does here? Jesus begins when the guy says, what can I do to have eternal life? He says, keep the commandments. The guy's like, I've done that. Which one's you talking about? And he starts with the commandment number six, seven, eight, nine, and goes back to five and leaves off 10. Never mentions number 10. What is the 10th commandment? No, don't covet. Don't be coveting your neighbor's stuff or your neighbor's things. Just don't be coveting stuff, right? So the guy interrupts Jesus. It appears as if he interrupts Jesus here. 
And Jesus goes on and says, honor your father and your mother. He goes back to number five, and he says, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, skips the tenth one. And the young man said unto him, all these have I kept from my youth up. What do I yet lack? Like, I want to know how to have eternal life. I want to know how to get there. And you're telling me I need to keep the commandments. I've kept all these from my youth up. Now, it goes on and says, Jesus goes on and says to him, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all that you have, give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. You want eternal life, he says? You want to go to heaven? Sell everything you have and follow me. The guy was not keeping one of the commandments, and Jesus knew which one it was. When the young man heard this saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. By the way, it's so much easier to give away everything you have when you have nothing, isn't it? But Jesus calls him to follow him. The guy has great possessions. And by the way, Jesus left off the one commandment that the guy had an issue with. He was very covetous. It was about his stuff. It was about his things, right? And so Jesus says, here's what you're going to have to do. If you want to have eternal life, there's something standing between you and eternal life. And this is very inconvenient, by the way. Get rid of all of it and follow me. You'll be fine. Now, think about this. The promise is to you. If you just get rid of all this stuff you see on this earth right now, you get to live forever. Now, I want to ask you the question right now. If it comes down to that for you right now, if I just get rid of all the stuff I have, I'm guaranteed to live forever. We would all say, I, I can do that. Right? I would like to think we all say, I can do that, right? Like if Jesus said that, if you, just, if you just get rid of everything you have, you have eternal life guaranteed. Like who wouldn't be willing to do that? Only a fool. But it says that the young man heard that saying and went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. And Jesus said to his disciples, so the guy walks away. And Jesus says, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter the kingdom of heaven. You know what I think is interesting about that text in a, in a contemporary setting, a modern-day contemporary setting? Jesus says it's almost impossible for a rich man to go to heaven, and everybody's striving to be rich and calling themselves Christian. Like the ministers, striving to be rich, telling their congregation, here's how to be rich. <laughs> and Jesus says... It's almost impossible for a rich man to go to heaven. You know, I wonder, I haven't looked at into this, but it just struck me. I wonder if the gender-neutral Bibles include women in this one too. I mean, when he says rich man, he's talking about everybody in general. But I, I was just reading some text this morning, and it, and the, it was the, um, oh, I'm trying to think of what text it was. But anyway, in the NIV, in the King James, it just says, uh, uses the word man. In the NIV, it uses the word um, uh, men and women but it does not in the original, right? And I was wondering if it uses men and women here. <laughs> because it's impossible almost for rich people. He's using it in the, in the generic term of, of humankind, mankind, to go to heaven if you're rich. And then he says in verse 24, Again, I say to you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Have you ever tried, some of you older people right now, to get the, the thread through the needle? Right? Now try to put a camel through there. Right? It's impossible, isn't it? Like, so Jesus says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And I've heard people say, I've read some commentaries, I disagree with them, I don't, I don't agree with them. They said, oh, well, you know, it's talking about the city gates, and they had the big city gate for everybody to go through, but then on the Sabbath they closed those gates, and they had the small city gate for people to walk through, and a camel couldn't get through there unless he took off all his burden and everything and squatted down and crawled through that gate. No, nah, I don't believe that. You know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a fanciful idea. You know, I've read some people, the commentary on it's fanciful to say, oh, yeah, the camel could take off all his burden, then he could fit through. So if the rich man will take off his burden, he could fit through. No, it's simply talking about the impossible is possible if you follow God. Can God make a camel pass through the eye of a needle? <laughs> right, that's it. Simple. But verse 25 says, getting back to the subject at hand, when the disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, then who can be saved? See, there was an idea, there was an understanding, there was a theory very much similar to what goes on in the Christian world today. If you're rich, then you must be blessed by God. If you have lots of stuff, 
you must be blessed by God. If you're healthy, it must be God's blessings that makes you healthy and wealthy. And if you have a good understanding and, you, and you're seen as wise to the, to the world, so if you're healthy and you're wealthy and you're wise, it must be God blessing you. So if God's blessing you in that way, you are sure in for heaven. And so you hear this young man who's rich, who's, who's wise, who has, who has it all going for him, comes to Jesus and says, what can I do to have eternal life? And Jesus turns and tells his disciples after he walks away, a rich man who is who's healthy and wealthy and a Jew has a very small chance of getting into heaven. And the disciples said, then, who can be saved? You might ask, the people ask a similar question even this very day. Right? I mean, that you can imagine how, how, like, difficult it was from the point of view. And just like it is today, when you see someone, perhaps a minister or someone else, that's dirt poor, and basically has nothing, and, and you, it's like they don't really usually have a much of a following of people because there's an attractiveness to people that are wealthy and, 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 and they have lots of things. There's an attractiveness to that, right? And so the, the disciples and others, when they would see people that were healthy and they were wealthy and they were Jews, they would say there's an, they would be attractive. They would have lots of followers because it was, it was something that it's like people said, you know, that must be something from God, obviously, so let's follow that. But with someone that walked around like Jesus with nothing but a, not even a pillow to lay his head on, it was hard to get followers, it's not appealing. It's still this very day. It's not appealing, is it? Do you want to know why the big churches with the flower and all the, all the big programs and all the neat stuff, why it has so many people? It's because it's, it's entertaining. It's, it's attractive. It's something that's, that's, that draws people in. And Hey, I understand that like back when um, um, uh, Bush was in office, right, and he went to church there locally, that they would have people calling the church on Sunday morning say, is the president going to be there today? And the minister and the people answering the phone, they would go to church. So that's where the, the, the wealthy, the president was or whatever, right? And so I understand the, the, the minister, the people answering the phone, got, got accustomed to saying, well, no, but God's going to be here. You know, there should be your attractiveness there. That should be your motive to come, not because some wealthy person's going to be at church, you know, that kind of thing. And so here the disciples, just like today, had the idea that these are the people that are on fast track to heaven. The motive for actually being a Jew, the motive for wanting to be one of the Sanhedrin, the motive for wanting to be, to be in the, that group was the, the fact that it was prestigious, it was great, it was convenient. And here Jesus is calling people away from those things to not have anything and follow him. You wonder how Christianity ever grew to the way it is in the world today. I mean, like true Christianity even especially, like how it even got there with that kind of motive. But the motive is eternal life. Young or old, motive is eternal life. And so, in verse 25, the disciples heard it. They were amazed, saying, who can be saved? <laughs> like, if the rich aren't going to be saved, then who can? And Jesus beheld them and said to them, with men, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. And so here is the message of the sermon today, which I really appreciate most of all. This one question, this is the theme, the idea, the whole, the whole bottom line of the message today. Then answered Peter and said to him, behold, we have forsaken everything and followed you. What do we get? Now, how many times have you read Peter saying something to Jesus and Jesus just jumping down his throat? I mean, in a nice way, right? Uh, Peter says, Lord, you know, this isn't going to happen to you. Get thee behind me, Satan, right? Hey, Lord, I'll never, I'll never forsake you, Lord. I'll, I'll, I'll be faithful to you to the very end. Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows. Every time Peter would say something, Jesus would in some way rebuke him because it would always be some kind of nonsense. Of all things that I think he would deserve to be rebuked for, when he turns to Jesus and says, I'm following you, what's in it for me? Like, have you ever, have you ever asked that question yourself? I have. I mean, I don't like the stress of getting up here every week. I don't like the stress of just trying to deal with people, individuals. Like, I've asked the question, what's in this for me? The paycheck isn't that good. What's in it for me? Right? And Peter asked that question, what's in it for me? What do we get out of it? And I can think back, and I, I don't know, maybe, maybe it hasn't went this way, but I would like to, I mean, thinking now as you read that, maybe for the first time you're reading the Bible through, let's say, and you would have to say, oh boy, Jesus is really getting ready to give it to him now. Like he, you've already read maybe other times in the Bible where, where Jesus has given Peter a hard time for some of the silly things he says, and if, if anything deserves a tongue thrashing, this is it, isn't it? What's in it for you, Peter? Do you know what I'm getting ready to go through? What's in it for you? Let me tell you what's in it for me. You know, as far as Jesus goes, right? 
but he doesn't. Listen to what he says. This is great news. Jesus said to them, Verily I say unto you, that you which have followed me in the regeneration. He's talking about the resurrection, by the way. If you look at the word regeneration, he's talking about the resurrection. When the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, you shall sit upon the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Like Peter asked what's in it for you, and Jesus says, you're going to be greatly blessed. And then he goes on. And everyone, that includes all of you. You want, you want motive for following Jesus? You want motive? What's in it for you? Here's your answer. If you've forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake, if you give up something for me, he says, if, you have to, if your family says if you're going to be the, one of those cult members and you're going to follow in that nonsense religion, if you're going to be that, I want nothing to do with you. And you say, well, I, you know, God doesn't want me to give up my family, and you don't give up, right? But, but Jesus actually says here, if, if, you don't, if, you're not willing to, if you're willing to give up any of those things, if you're willing to turn to me and surrender to me and, and any of those things that may go away, you're willing to give that up for me. He doesn't say you have to give it up. He's talking about now if you're willing to give it up, if that's your priorities, if I'm your priority, he says. Anyone that has forsaken houses and brethren or mothers or sisters or fathers or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive, listen to this, a hundredfold. Now, he's not talking about heaven here yet. He's talking about in this life a hundredfold. Luke's version actually says it that way. In this life a hundredfold. I remember questioning that one in Bible study. A hundredfold more. You mean in this life, I give up these things and I receive a hundredfold more now? And then he says, and shall receive a hundredfold and, in the, and have everlasting life. So if you give it up now, you get a hundredfold more now and everlasting life. Well, how does that work now? But you, you keep in mind, by the way, and it's the same way in Christianity, true Christianity to this very day as it was in the early church, when the disciples, you remember how the, we've read and been studying this in our Sabbath school. If you've been studying your Sabbath school lesson, you've been studying this, how they, they basically was, everybody was just giving everything they have up. At, at that moment, they were actually doing that to help others, right? And, and the more they gave up, the more, the more community they had, the more fellowship they had, and, and, and it's like they had everything they ever needed. It's amazing how that worked for them, wasn't it? And, and so I, I, was, I was telling my wife, and I've talked this story before, I can remember when I first became a Christian, my family, I mean, honestly, my family thought I joined a cult. To this day, they think I'm leading one. Right? They, it's like, you are nuts. That, that, I mean, that's the, that's the mindset. That, actually, it's, it's just craziness. What you're doing is just crazy. That's, that's the thought process, even to this very day. Now, I haven't given up my, my family. I mean, they still talk to me, and we, we fellowship, and we have a relationship. But it's not like it used to be, you understand? And I had lost friends and others. And, and, but I, it's so fascinating that I have friends and family and places all over the world. It's really, it truly is an amazing thing. And I think it works like that for everybody as, as we're faithful to God. I, I can think, I can think like when I first, um, I, I, I was becoming a, a Christian and become a Seventh-day Adventist. And, and for the first time, I don't know how long we've been married, but for the first time I was going to be away from Laura on Sabbath. Like she was my babysitter, my take, caretaker on Sabbath, right? I didn't know what to do. And I had to go away from my job to Boston for two weeks. I was, uh, by the way, I, what I was doing is I, I, I was, um, le learned to program these, uh, it was HP 30, uh, 3075, I think. Anyway, they were in circuit test machines. We make, they make circuit boards, and these are the machines that test the circuit boards. Open, and I was doing the programming on that, learning to do that. Anyway, so I was going to be up for two weeks for specialized training. And I remember, like, that first week there, I'm staying in this hotel. And I'm like, oh, man, I got Sabbath coming up. What am I going to do? And so, I, um, Friday evening, I ordered two pizzas. One for Friday evening and one for Sabbath. And I found me a church. I was like, I'm going to go to church on Sabbath. So I got up the next morning, I went to church, and I come in, and it's a little church of about 50 or 60 people there, right? And you know how all you little old ladies, you just, particularly little old ladies, they just love to hug people, right? And they see young, fresh blood and they're like, oh, where are you from? And they're hugging me and going on, you know. And, and I, I was a hugophobic at the time. I have a phobia about that. I used to another story another time. And, and they're, they're hugging me, and they're like, oh, where are you from? And I said, oh, I'm here, and, you know, and I gotta go, I, I'm working this week and been going to class, and i got to go to class again Monday through Friday, and I'll just be here this weekend on Sabbath. And, and the, the, I was there just, a, it wasn't no time they tried to talk to me. And this one little old lady's like, well, don't be staying at that hotel. They can't be good food there. You just come and stay at our house. We have, a, we have a room in the basement, and you can just stay there, and we'll make sure you have plenty of food. And I was like, no, 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 it's okay, really. 
<laughs> and, and so then I went, and went into church and sat down and, and um, had a nice little service, you know. Then afterward, they had a potluck, and they, they uh, insisted, there were, again, there were more people insisting that I come and stay with them this week instead of staying in the hotel. They didn't know who I was, <laughs> right? And then it's like, oh, we don't want you to go hungry this week. And they had plates. I'm not plate, but plates of food like this, like three or four of them. And they would stack, Here, you can take this back to your hotel with you because you can eat good food this week, you know. And uh, it was just a wonderful thing, right? None of them even knew me. And I got, wow. Jesus says, in this life, you have hundredfold more houses and brethren and mothers and fathers and land. And it's true. Even to this very day. That's one example. I could go on with many others of things that have happened. I'm sure maybe happened with you. It's amazing when people are converted and when they're following Christ, how there's a, there's a camaraderie, there's a, there's a fellowshipping there going on, a family-type environment. And if you're not feeling that, maybe it's because um, you haven't really yourself been willing to give and share and love in the same way. But Jesus has promised us, when Peter asked the question, what do I get? He didn't rebuke him, but he promised good things. Isn't that wonderful? By the way, not only does he promise a hundredfold more of houses and lands and all this kind of stuff, but it actually says there, and inherit, what's the words? Eternal life, everlasting life. Isn't that the question? Isn't that the motive? I mean, isn't that the ultimate motive for every one of us? What do I get out of it? And he says, eternal life. That's what you get out of it. If there's no reward, then there is no motive. But there is reward. We have a motive. And so I'm going I'm to finish here in, in a last text here in 1 Corinthians 15. So anybody that does, follows through, gives their heart to Christ, goes through the waters of baptism, becomes part of God's family, you have great incentive. I mean, you're promised much more family. Who couldn't use much more family? The un only unfortunate thing with that is with much more family, there's much more family problems because every family has family problems, right? But then on top of that, eternal life. Wow. And think about that, eternal life. And so if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I won't read it all right now. I'm just going to get to the, the bulk of it, but Paul is making this strong argument for the, the fact that there's a resurrection going to take place and the hope of the resurrection, and he says this. Verse 16 of 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 16, If the dead do not rise, and Christ is not raised, and if Christ is not raised, your faith is in vain. You're yet in your sins. Then they also which have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. In other words, your motive for following Jesus is in ruins. If there's no eternal life, if there's no resurrection, your whole motive for following God is a waste. There's no, there was no purpose here. We're, we're, we're wasting our time. And he says this in verse 19, if in this life only, this is one of my most favorite verses, by the way, if in this life only we have hope in Christ Jesus, we are of all men most miserable. Right? So if, if you think it's all about this world, all about the here and now, it, it, you know, as many people are focusing on, he said it's miserable, it's terrible. There's got to be something else. The real motive, the real reward has to be eternal life. Without that, we get the same result as the heathen. Actually, without eternal life, you get the same result as your dog, as a deer, as a bird, right? As a, as, as a fish. The same result. If there's no resurrection, if there's no eternal life, your reward is the same as any animal. And so Paul's argument here says, okay, there is going to be a resurrection. The reason for following Christ is the fact that he has defeated death and if you'll follow him, you're promised a resurrection. What in this life is worth giving up for that? Right? Well, I guess you could say it another way. What in this life is worth losing that over? And so he says, if this life is the only place, the only place we have Christ, hope in Christ, and we're, we're all men, we're the most miserable there, uh, there is. If there's no eternal life, then it's not worth it. So that's our motive. That's our motive for following Jesus. <clears throat> I read this book, and I really love this one quote out of it. It says, it's from David Simpson quoted this, he says this, he says, if then the religion of Jesus be a delusion, at least it's a happy delusion, and even a wise man would scarcely wish to be undeceived. In other words, if the hope that we have 
this eternal life and this, this whole walking with Jesus and, and following him, believing in him, if it, if, if it, even if it were a delusion, at least, at least it's a happy one. And only a, only a, a, a fool would want to be undeceived. <laughs> I think about that in the, in the closing statement. When I think about what am I getting out of this, I'm getting out of this a great hope, assurance that this ain't all there is. So what do you get? Eternal life. Is there anything on this earth to you worth losing that over? I'm very grateful to have this opportunity and blessing and privilege in this world, as all of us should be. And I want to encourage if anyone here hasn't given their heart to Christ, if you've got things in this world, things in your life that you think is so much more important, like I'm going to, when I get things straightened away and this straightened away, then I'll, I'll follow Jesus with all my heart. I'll, I'll turn my life over to him. If you're waiting for that, I want you to think about what, it's, what you're actually, actually giving up for whatever it is you're living for now. It's not worth it. I like the text that says, today is the day of salvation. And my friends, today would be the day.